Good evening, everybody. This is Pastor Green. Welcome to our weekly Bible study. We're so elated to have you with us tonight. We're in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. The 1 Timothy is the first of the pastoral epistles. Uh, this, uh, this book was written by Paul to his son in the ministry, Timothy, and that's why that's where it gets his name. We're going to start out with a word of prayer, <coughs> and then we will, we, we will present it. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to stand before your people once again and to share the, the truth of your word. So we just thank you. We praise you. We ask you right now for, for clarity of mind and thought that we may convey the truth, that we might apprehend the truth, that we might change some lives, and that we might change ourselves. So we thank you, we praise you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. <coughs> first Timothy is the first of two epistles that Paul wrote to Timothy. Uh, his greeting is very familiar. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Paul declares that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ and it's not by his opinion not by his will but by the commandment of God God, God made him and he will uh, this is we see this oftentimes in the pastoral epistles he says our savior six times in the pastoral epistles uh, the pastoral epistles are first and second Timothy and, and Titus. Uh, these, these are letters he wrote to young preachers in the ministry that he had brought up. So he says here in verse 2, Unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So he has identified Timothy as his own son. Uh, this uh, word, uh, his, his own son, it could be translated uh, his true son, his genuine son. In fact, the, 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 uh, um, the Greek actually uses a word here, genesios, and it actually means legitimate. So it's like uh, uh, the, he is owning Timothy in a very profound way. He he's he's proud of Timothy, and he's and he he wrote this letter to encourage him and to give him instructions on how to be a better how to be a better pastor, and that's really what this is all about. He said, uh, "My own son," and then when he says, and he used this in both uh, Timothy and Titus, were brought into the ministry uh, by Paul. Paul led them to Christ, and Paul taught them how to be a preacher, how to be a minister of God, and, and they were very effective. Verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So Paul is, he, he's starting out here in the verse, really verses 3 through 10, as a warning against unsound doctrine. What do pastors supposed to do? Well, they're supposed to, they're supposed to teach sound doctrine. Why? Because when you teach sound doctrine, people learn how to act. If you don't, they don't do, they can't do what they don't know. So if you're teaching unsound doctrine, people are gonna be all over the place. So you have to be consistent in your teaching, consistent in your walk, and Paul was encouraging Timothy to, um, to warn those, because here's the thing, uh, as a pastor, you gotta, you're training other pastors. You don't know who's gonna be a pastor. So you gotta teach it in such a way where when they start, when someone else start teaching what you teach, what you taught them, that the people who you are influencing generational thinking. So it, when one person leads another to Christ, you have the responsibility to bring them up with sound doctrine so when they begin to lead others to Christ, they can do the same. So if you all wishy-washy, 
uh, folk ain't gonna get better. You're gonna see folk in the church for years and they're gonna keep struggling. Now, I've seen people stay in a struggle because they have they live undisciplined lives and they might be getting sound doctrine, but if you don't apply it, um, it won't it can't change your life. It is just that simple. So he's warning against unsound doctrine. That's what these next uh, few verses are all about. When he says, verse 3, uh, uh, to teach no other doctrine, he says, um, don't teach, basically what he's saying, not to teach different doctrine. Teach what I taught you. That's what he's saying. Teach what I taught you. He says, and, and I beseech you still, and he, and he, they were at Ephesus when he wrote this. He said, abide thee still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia. Uh, and uh, verse 4, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Uh, 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 in other words, Tell them not to give their time to meaningless stories. You, you know, don't go off on deep ends. Uh, uh, don't go uh, using long list of names just to prove uh, family histories. Uh, that's something that the Gnostics used to do. Uh, they, they, you know, there's a lot of genealogies in the uh, Old Testament that were beneficial because the names meant something. But don't just be ro rolling off the names just to let people know you know the names. Because in the Old Testament, a lot of times the names, in, in fact, usually those names had a meaning. And if you understood the names in the genealogy, you could understand a lot, a lot about the character and the the ministry and the uh, and how God would use those people in their everyday walk. So he says, don't get into that because it don't it, it, it does not help. It does not. All it does is cause confusion. So don't get into that. And when you say fables, the, 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 the Greek word muthos, where we get myths. You remember now, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of uh, mythology from the Roman and Greek world that was out there. And he is saying, don't get into that. Uh, 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 don't go around repeating old wives' tales. Because uh, it, it does not benefit. Uh, it, it does not, it, rather than, uh, it, it causes confusion rather than God edifying. The idea is you want to build people up in their faith. You don't want to confuse them. So he says, don't give heed to those fables, uh, th those myths, so to speak. And, and that, 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 um, that Greek word, muthos, that's where we get the word myth from. Don't be, don't be teaching fiction. Don't give, don't give heed to, to the fiction. Don't even repeat it. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. That word charity should really be love because that's the Greek word uh, agape. When you, in, in the King James call, uses the word charity, but it really should be love. Love out of a pure heart. And do what's right. And, and and do when when your faith in God is real, you can do what's right. When your faith in God is real, you can do what's right. So you love your fellow man because you have faith in God, and you know that God got a plan for their life, and God will use you to help execute that plan, help unveil that plan. That's why you want to teach sound doctrine. And he says here. From which some have swerved, having turned aside unto vain jangling. Uh, 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 you know, uh, you know. Some have missed the key points. Not everybody got. Not everybody got it. Regardless of how sound the doctrine is, not everybody's gonna get it. And then he does something that, and you, we'll see this a little bit later. He actually called a, a, a few folk out. He says, uh, what he's saying is, verse 7, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say 
nor where uh, they affirm. They, they don't know what they're talking about, and they don't even understand the stuff that uh, that they say it, but they teach it anyway. So he says, stay away from folks like that. He says, some have swerved. The thing is, they have always been apostates, even in the early church. Some folks start out. And then they go off on the tangents. Uh, I've seen pastors. Dude. I remember years ago, one of the uh, uh, early leaders in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, he used to walk with Dr. King. Uh, he walked with um, Jesse Jackson back when they were young men in the, uh, in the Civil Rights Movement. And uh, later on, Benjamin Shavers, that was his name. Later on, he left Christianity and went to Islam. He was hanging out with um, Louis Farrakhan. Go figure. You know, he just swerved. He left the Christian faith. Well, there were folk way back in Paul's day who left the Christian faith. Uh, there were folk who were walking with Jesus. In John 6, 63, Jesus said, uh, he asked Peter, he said, are you going to go away with the rest of them? And Peter said, uh, thou hast the words of eternal life. Where I'm going. Well, there are always going to be folk who walk away. Because when you find out that the uh, Christian life requires a level of dedication not, not everybody want to do. It requires you to give up your right to self, and not everybody want to do that. Not everybody want to see the throne of Jesus Christ, the, 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 the throne of their life. Everybody don't want to do it. They want to have it their way. And, and, and unfortunately... Um, it, it it destroys your faith. It destroys your walk. It destroys your witness. And uh, you got to decide: Am I going to be walking with Jesus, or is it going to be somebody else? Because you can't walk two ways. You see, the follow Jesus or don't go. That simple. So he says, verse eight. But we know that the law is good if a man uses it lawfully. He, he know see. When you're teaching the law, and uh, they taught grace, but he did not omit the law. When he's talking about the law, he's talking about the law of God, not necessarily the law of Moses. The law is good. Knowing this, that the law is not made for righteous man, but for lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy, profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and manslayers. Uh, the, what the law does, it just points out that we bad people. That's what the Bible does. It teaches us that that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You, you study the Bible long enough, you're going to see yourself. You're going to see your flaws if you look at it honestly. You're going to see your flaws. You're going to see your error. You're going to see the error in your ways. All of us got faults. The key is when, uh, when the Bible reveals something to us, we can't just let it go. We can't act like it's not there. We got to deal with it. Uh, we ask the Lord to give us the power to resist this. All of us got some appetites that we need to uh, that need to be crushed because if we yield to our appetites, we'd be all over the place. We can't talk about being servants of Jesus Christ if we yield to our members all the time. You, what the Holy Spirit does, He gives you control over your appetite, gives you control over your desires. Does anybody ever smoke the joint? Remember how it felt. Anybody ever did drugs, they remember how it felt. But the, the, but the drugs can kill you. You remember how it made you feel, but you also know that that's not right. So you got to make the decision that, okay, I, that feeling might have been good 20 years ago, but I'm not going back. Because it'll kill you. Damages your witness. Damages your life. So, and that's what he's talking about here. These the law is good. Look at verse 10. For whoremongers, basically talking about people who commit sexual sins, and, uh, uh, and, and, and them that defile themselves with mankind, those who practice homosexuality. For men stealers, uh, those who sell slaves. Uh, uh, for perjured persons, uh, those are folk who lie a lot. Uh, you know, once upon a time, every other word came out of my mouth was a lie. 
This girl told me one time, I was the lionest nigga she know. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, that's bad when somebody tell you something like that. That's bad. That's why I can be faithful to my wife now, because I was just, I was called out a long time ago as a young buck. And I decided I couldn't be like that. For if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, what he's saying is, those who don't tell the truth under oath and those who are against true teaching of God, you know, it's going to be people like that. And for folk like that, according to the verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. But he said, know that the law is good. The law is good. And you need to know this. So when you're teaching God's word, you're teaching the law of God. And for those who violate it, those who practice things that is contrary to sound doctrine, they're going to be all over the place. And that's what Paul is trying to convey here. That's, that's why sound doctrine is so important. You, you got to, in order for people to live right, they got to know how to live. And that's what a pastor is supposed to do. Teach people how to live biblically. Teach people how to think biblically. If you don't know how to think biblically, you can't act biblically. And he didn't say act uh, 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 pharisaically. Y'all didn't get that part. See, we can be little Pharisees. You know, you can be so earthly, heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Recognize people have flaws and we got to... You want to use grace and mercy as we correct folk use grace remember what look what he said way back here in, uh, in verse 3 verse 2 he said grace mercy and peace grace mercy and peace that's how we want to live now, regardless of what you do, however you correct people, if you, if you can use grace, mercy, and peace while you're doing it, you may have a chance to turn somebody out of, away from the world to Jesus Christ. But if you're always harsh, we're going to have a tough time winning them to the Lord. He said, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who have enabled me that for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. When he says accounting me faithful uh, uh, Jesus Christ and remember now you got to remember Paul's history he's going to give us a little bit of that when we get to verse 11. Uh, um, See, the local church should teach sound doctrine to ensure correct conduct. And in order for men to, men need to think right in order to act right. If you don't think right, you got stinking thinking, your, your behavior is going to follow. So when he say here, when we get here to this 11th verse, he be really begins to give his own personal testimony. Look what he said in verse 12. And I thank the Lord Jesus who has enabled me for he counted me faithful putting me in the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. You see, Paul was a Pharisee. He, in fact, he said he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was one of the worst. He used to go around killing Christians. In fact, he sick the, the goons on him. He hold a coach while somebody else killed him. Right? The, the, soldier, the temple soldiers would kill him. That's what he did. He went around rounding up Christians. I, I mean, he was, um, he was a mess. And he thought he was doing God a favor until he had that dramatic, dramatic, that, Damascus Road experience when God knocked him off uh, a, a, a donkey and, uh, and showed him the light. Jesus came to him, blinded him. He was walking around blind for about 30 days till his vision came back. Uh, Jesus came to him and, and, and openly. It wasn't just a, 
and, and, uh, 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 and, and he was blind he was blinded by the light the light of Jesus came to him completely unfiltered and, and he couldn't see his, his vision eventually came back but when it did not only did it come back but he also had spiritual insight see when the, when the Holy Spirit uh, ministers to us we learn how to think and act biblically but we got to learn what scriptures say first. It doesn't happen automatically. He said before was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious. But he did it ignorantly. And, and see, th this is actually Paul's statement. That was his statement of life before the Damascus Road experience. And mercy is what the sinner needs, not justice. Because we deserve, we deserve death. But thank God he gives us mercy. And that's what he did with Paul. And that's what Paul is saying. Look at um, look at this 15th verse. Uh, 14th verse. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, that's not just hyperbole. He was a he was messed up. You read about his uh, his uh, uh, exploits in uh, the book of Acts, and you see uh, he was really jacked up. But Jesus Christ came to him, revealed himself to Paul, turned Saul of Tarsus into Paul the apostle, and his life was forever changed. And because of Paul, a great many people got saved, including Timothy and Titus. Once they got saved, Paul uh, equipped them in the faith. He taught them sound doctrine. And they taught other people sound doctrine. And they became pastors of pastors. So uh, 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 Paul, and, and as we go through this book of Timothy, Timothy is going to give a lot of instructions. Folk who might want to do work ministry, uh, 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 Timothy is a good place to start. If you want to do, you want to be a pastor, Timothy is a good place to start because he'll teach you how he teach you what you need to know to be a pastor. You, uh, we're going to get into what the qualifications, um, certain things you really need to know what you need to be able to do as a pastor. There are certain qualities that a, a good pastor is going to have. And those who don't have those qualities usually don't do well impacting other people's lives. You see them falling. See, you, you know, if, uh, uh, you, you see a lot of pastors mess up. Look what he's saying. How be it? For this cause I obtain mercy that me first, Jesus Christ, might show forth all long suffering for a pattern of them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He used himself as the example. How he is, he is as, as bad as they were. He was the worst of the worst, but Jesus Christ saved him, got him on the right path, taught him. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to him. Paul got it by direct revelation. Now, see, you remember, Paul was a Pharisee. He knew the scripture. He just didn't know what it meant. He, he learned the scripture through the, from the Pharisees and the rabbinic traditions. Once he learned how erroneous it was, and he could separate the truth from the fiction. You know, if you got a good biblical foundation, and he had it as a Pharisee, but the Pharisees' hearts weren't right, so they didn't apply it right. Well, once Paul got saved, he was able to apply it right because his heart was changed. When you actually uh, um, working for God out of love, rather than from some rudimentary set of rules and regulations. Things work completely different. It's easy to um, to minister to people when you love them. The Pharisees didn't love nobody. They loved nobody but themselves. So they couldn't change people's lives. They couldn't be changed themselves. And that's just how it was. So, and, and, and this is what Paul is talking about here. So he says, and when, and when he says um, this is a faithful saying. Uh, He's not just yeasting it up. He said it's worthy of all acceptations that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. 
when we understand that, we can appreciate who Jesus is and how he can minister to us and how we're able to minister to other people, to save sinners. We can't save them by beating them across the head with a Bible. That's been tried. It don't work. How can you how can you say how can you get people to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, you got to love them. You got to show them some love. Uh, 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 you got to be able to communicate with them in in a loving manner, so that what you're saying can be received. You might be telling the truth, but if you're being harsh, they're not going to receive it. So. Speak the truth in love. Verse 17. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor, glory, forever and ever. Amen. That is a doxology. He's given a doxology there, ending his own personal statement. And when we get here to verse 18, what he's about to do is give Timothy his charge. I used to love this old song that the old Baptist uh, deacons used to sing, A charge to keep I have, a God to glorify. Hey, child. You ever been to old Baptist church? The old deacons used to sing. Remember that song, Dave? Old Deacon Hooks used to love that one. Hey, child. Uh, Harry Hodges, uh, uh, Uncle Joe used to sing it out and stuck it. Hey, child. To keep. I live in my best life. But anyway, he's giving Timothy his charge. Look at verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou might by them might as war a good warfare. See, when, 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 when Timothy started preaching, Paul laid his hands on him, prayed over him, prophesied over his life. He, pro he laid hands on him, he prophesied over his life. And, and what he is saying here, I, I, I charge, this charge I commit unto you, Timothy, according to the prophecies with which, which went before on thee. He prophesied over it. He, he spoke life. He spoke success. He spoke, uh, he spoke power into the life and ministry of Timothy. And, and he prayed for Timothy that he might war the good warfare and remember at the end of Paul's ministry he said I fought the good fight well he, he, he's telling uh, Timothy I want you to be able to fight a good fight too now Paul wasn't through here Paul wasn't even close to being through when he wrote this epistle he had a few more years before they would martyr him and he knew that when he was gone uh, it was going to be men like Timothy that would, that would take up the mantle and keep the gospel going verse 19 holding faith and a good conscience which having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck you, you see if, if you don't fight the good fight if you don't hold faith you're going to end up shipwreck you, you can't be wishy-washy with this you can't be in the day and out tomorrow and think you can come back it don't work that way in fact Look at verse 20, the last verse here in this chapter. Of whom Hymenius and Alexander, whom, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that, may, that they may learn not to blaspheme. You, you know, when folk just fall away and just turn ratchet, folk who might have been with you once upon a time and they go out the back door, uh, uh, they backslide so to you, look like they've never touched the Bible, never heard a sermon, never went to church. He, he calls out to here Hymenius and Alexander Alexander the coppersmith uh, Alexander the coppersmith you, you, you will see him in some more um, as you go through because it's not the first time that he's been talked about and it won't be the last Alexander the coppersmith uh, he, Paul said he did it much wrong Alexander must have did some serious loss in him Paul. you know people talk about you behind your back people will try to undermine your ministry People will try to uh, uh, damage your reputation. They talk about you. They, they, they slander your name. Well, that's what Hymenius and, um, and, 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 uh, and Alexander did. And, and Paul said, I, look, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just leave them in God's hands. Because God will give them better than I can. He said, I'm just going to leave that in God's hands. He said, I delivered them unto Satan. Satan had them. See, some folks, you, you, quit, you don't even pray for them no more. Don't even worry about it. Satan got him. Satan got him. Ain't nothing you could do about it. 
you, you can keep praying for him. But Paul saying here, boy, he, he Satan got him. He's acknowledging that they had that they were on Satan's side all the while. They were just playing like they were part of, uh, of the team. And, and you're gonna find out in due season that some folk who you thought was with you not with you. And just because you find out that some folk who was with you, who you thought was with you, are not with you, they ain't with you because they're not with Christ. If you're with Christ, they ain't with you. It's not you, it's Christ that they don't want to be with. So don't take it personal. It's not you they abandon it, it's Jesus Christ they abandon it. And, and so we're going to continue in uh, 1 Timothy, we'll be at chapter 2 next week. We're going to go all through 1st and 2nd Timothy, then we're going to finish it up, we'll, uh, then we're going to do Titus. So we're going to look at all three of the pastoral epistles, and um, somebody's going to actually benefit from this. Father in heaven, we thank you, we praise you, we ask you right now, Lord, to continue to bless our homes, bless our families, bless our ministries. Uh, we lift up those that are listening to this, there are those that are uh, catching it live and those that will catch it later. Uh, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that you will loose prosperity and your grace and your mercy upon their lives. Uh, enrich them so that they can be a blessing to others. That they might walk the walk and fight the good fight. And be a witness in this wicked world that men will come out of the darkness into your marvelous light. I lift up the people of, of the Ukraine, Lord. I pray that you continue to keep a hedge of protection around them. Uh, I pray for the people of Russia, Lord, that they will rise up against wickedness. So we just thank you, we praise you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We'll see you all next time, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. We'll see you Sunday at um, 1020. Uh, we're going through the Gospel of St. Luke. Uh, we'll be heading into the Passion season pretty soon. Actually, we're already there. And uh, uh, just look forward to seeing you and look forward to, to, to sharing the truth of God's Word. We'll see you all next time.